We're going to jump right into Mark without any, without any commentary. We're going to go right to the book of Mark, chapter 14. And I want to read a, a couple verses to you where we ended a couple weeks ago. I know about uh, Judas betraying Jesus, and I want to read those four or a couple verses. Otherwise, you, you're wondering, where are we heading? And uh, beginning in verse 44, Judas, one of the twelve, is about to betray Jesus. And so the scripture teaches us, it says, now the betrayer, who's that? Judas, had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss, the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And so now we know the scene as we move to verse 53. And we begin reading what the scripture teaches us about what took place next. They took Jesus to the high priest and to the chief priest and elders and teachers of the law. They came together. Remember, these are your preachers, your professors, your clergymen, <clears throat> your pastors. You must think in that way because they were the guardians of truth. These were the people that were ready to defame Jesus and to have him killed. And then think of yourself when you think about Peter. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And there he sat with the guards and warmed himself by the fire. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days will build another, not made by man. Yet even then their testimonies did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked them, Are you not going to answer what are you not going to answer what is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? <clears throat> but Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, remember the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. Remember, that was the name he gave Moses when the Egyptians asked, who sent you? Or the Israelites asked, who are you to rule over us? Who sent you? He said, tell them, I am, that I am sent you. So they knew when he made the statement, I am. He was equating himself with God. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming in the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him with their fist and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. I've entitled this morning's message, Looking for Dirt. And what is, what is a couple things that I, as a, as a pastor, as a shepherd, would like for you to take away this morning when you leave this place? Number one, what Jesus did for us and the courage he showed us and the conduct and his behavior in the midst of his enemies, you and me will face such times because Jesus said all of us will be persecuted 
for their faith. If you identify yourself with Jesus. So we want to learn from his example what he actually did for us. I'm sure at times you and me are wishing, I wish you would have called out those 12 legion of angels to show them how powerful you are. Haven't you ever said that to yourself when you read these passages? But had he not kept quiet and not went to the cross, you and me would never be able to have a relationship with the Father in heaven. Second takeaway, to be aware of the signs of the so-called righteous people behaving in wicked ways, being wicked people, trying to make innocent Christians like Jesus and the apostles look guilty or make you look guilty or make me look guilty. We need to be aware of the signs and the fruit, lest we be deceived ourselves. Well, let me give you a kind of a case in point as I thought about this. <clears throat> I thought about a trial that happened in 2006, and that was the Duke lacrosse team. And you may know that this went public and already in the court of public opinion, they condemned all of the lacrosse team. They had to quit their season all because of false accusations. Let me remind you, 46 of the 47 members of the team that were accused of, well, three actually were accused of raping a prostitute. But 46 of the 47 of the team submitted their DNA to Mike Nifong, who was an attorney running for office. He wanted to become the district attorney for the Durham County. He reportedly conspired with the director of the private DNA testing facility to withhold the reports that would exonerate or exclude all the lacrosse players from the purported rape. Also in cohesion was the Durham police and a DNA lab. All had conspired to frame these three Duke lacrosse players. Now, since then, of course, Mike DeFong won his re-election, but then he was barred for life after they found out the players were innocents. All charges against the men were ultimately dropped. It was very tragic. They were completely cleared of any wrongdoing, and the young lady, Mangum, was not charged with making false statements, and as I said, Nifong was dis barred from practicing law anymore. But the players had already been convicted in the court of public opinion. And the loss of their lacrosse season was the least of the impacts of these wrongfully accused cases. Well, you would think that this was not possible to happen to believers in the church or in Christendom. I want us to look, first of all, at this case of the accusation that Jesus is the Son of God. And so let's look, first of all, in verse 53. The religious leaders are looking for dirt. I've entitled this morning's message, Looking for Dirt. Isn't it ironic that God made us out of the dirt, and we've been trying to make dirt of God ever since. We're trying to make God in the dirt image. Well, Religious leaders were definitely, have been, and were looking for dirt on Jesus. Notice in, in verse 53, they took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and teachers of the law came together. I, 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 sometimes we feel so distant from what actually took place, but you must understand, anything we know about God, all the schools that would teach about theology about God, all the professors, all the people that translated scripture so that you would understand it, were all in that place, all the very important religious people that you would not suspect would go against God. They said they love God. But Jesus said, if you love God, you would love me. But they hated the son of God. You would not expect them to behave in such a manner. And the people did not. And they were hoodwinked in going along with the chief priest. And we studied the Old Testament. His great role that the chief priest had in confessing the sins 
of the nation of Israel going into the Holy of Holies once a year representing a shadow of how Jesus would die on the cross and he now would make a way for us to go into the presence of God. That's the kind of role this high priest had. And then the other priest making sacrifices for sin. And then the supreme court of religion in Israel. All were in cahoots to find dirt on the son of the living God. They didn't even obey their own laws. We kind of think of the Constitution. We think of the Declaration of Independence. And we think of um, how many of our political leaders do not follow what the Constitution says, what the Declaration of Independence says. And the Sanhedrin did not go by the Mishnah, which guided them on their practices of law, nor Deuteronomy chapter 16 or 17, which taught them how to handle such cases. Let me give you a case in point. This trial, as you know, was taken on the eve or actually the beginning of the morning at 12 midnight, now starting the actual Passover that they would celebrate, was at midnight. No trial was supposed to be held that night according to their laws. Again, Christians need to see signs along the way to look at people, even though they're in high positions or low positions, you need to begin to see the signs that these things are not done according to the word of God. These things that they're being accused of are not according to the laws of God. Second, the verdict in a capital case saying he's guilty of murder, they, they could not try in the next few hours. They had to take a full day and a half and actually fast. Another night had to pass before they could actually bring the final verdict they didn't pay attention to any of the scriptures that they taught. These were the leaders of God, of who he is, of Yahweh, of the Messiah, of the prophets. They were so full of hate that they forgot everything they had ever learned. And third, the trial could not be held on the eve of the Sabbath. Well, there are other things I could share with you about this trial, but the trial was a miscarriage of justice that violated the Mosaic law, the rabbinical law, and the civil law. The timing of the trial was illegal according to the Jewish judicial code. Their animosity had reached the point that they were not interested in administering justice. They were interested in killing Jesus. You would think that's not possible in our day. Probably in the last 500 years, I think of two great, great theologians who were once, like you, unbelievers and became a believer. I think of Martin Luther and I think of John Calvin. Now, many great leaders have done wrong. King David did wrong. I'm not throwing him under the bus. That's up to God to decide whether or not they were his children. But remember, a whole denomination or denominations have been named after these religious leaders. You take... Martin Luther, who was a regular believer or lost person, and then he found out you're saved by faith. And then, of course, he was Catholic, and then he didn't like some of the things that the Catholic Church was doing or teaching, so he posted on the church door of, uh, let's see, the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, his 95 thesis that he wanted to debate these issues with the Catholic Church. Well, of course, he was branded as a heretic by the Catholic Church and condemned as an outlaw by the Holy Roman Empire just because he saw things differently. Now, you think because of that verdict, Martin Luther would have gotten it right the rest of his life. Well, first of all, he was for the Jewish people in his ministry. He was a theologian, a German theologian, a great writer, a great pastor, great theologian. But in the beginning, he was for the Jewish people. But when he found out he couldn't convert them, he became anti-Semitic. And he was violent against the Jews. In his writings on the Jews and their lies, he basically said this. He urged, he denounced them, the Jewish people, and urged their persecution. In his treaty... He urges that Jewish synagogues and schools be set on fire, 
prayer books be destroyed, rabbis being forbidden to preach, Jewish homes burnt, and property and money confiscated. What I'm trying to do is, again, set the table for you that you have to be on your P's and Q's. You need to be walking with God that you will see the signs of whether or not preachers in the pulpit, your seminary professors, the people that are in front of you, like the Billy Grahams or the, or the John MacArthur's of the world that, that, uh, the, or the Vody Bachman's of the world, the people that you listen to all the time, that, that they're telling you the truth. And I believe a lot of these men are telling the truth. But you need to be able to spot an imposter who's leading God's people astray. Or accusations that are, that are coming against the Son of God or against these theologians. Are they true or are they not? I'm telling you in this message, I'll give you some indications of whether or not these people need to be indicted. Give you some signs along the way saying, hmm, I see the fruit that identifies them either with the devil or with God. So John Calvin, by the way, his writings were used by Julius Steicher in the 1946 Nuremberg trials. He quoted this writing as justification for butchering the Jews. That's how influential his writings were. So if you're ready to write off Martin Luther and say, oh, no, he really wasn't as bad as we think he was, at least that part of his life was absolutely terrible, and he hoodwinked the believers in God to go along with them. What about John Calvin? I know we have a lot of people listening, and I love a lot of my Calvinists, but here was a great leader, a great theologian. What he didn't like is someone going against his teaching, especially his institutes of religion, and he had one such person that went against him. See, he sat on a board in 1541 called the Consistory, a church court that oversaw the discipline of citizens in Geneva. And they met every Thursday to review the cases of heresy. And uh, John Calvin led the court. Um, although they didn't have the power technically to condemn someone, they had a mighty influence on the magistrate in the land to do such kinds of killing. Well, there was a guy named Michael Servetus. He was a physician, a scientist, a biblical scholar that was Calvin's longtime acquaintance. They're buddies. But he resisted the authority of the Catholic Church, which John Calvin was for. But when he read the Institutes of Religion, his massive volume on the doctrines of God and the teachings of the church, he disagreed with some of those things and he put it in the margin, and he was going to meet him later to talk about it, and John Calvin found out about it. We know for sure he wanted him killed because of this. So here's what happened when he uh, angered Calvin by returning the copy of Calvin's Institutes with critical comments in the margins. <clears throat> Calvin <clears throat> said this, Servetus offers to come hither. You have to understand their lingo back in that day to come to church. Because he said if he's coming to church, he's not getting out. And if it be agreeable to me, but I am unwilling to pledge my word for his safety. For if he shall come, I shall never permit him to depart alive, provided my authority be of any avail. The next time Cephatus attended Calvin's church preaching service on a visit... Calvin had him arrested and charged with heresy. The 38 officials included rejection of infant baptism was the reason why they wanted him murdered. How terrible was it? October 27, 1553, green and wood was used for the fire so that Savitris would be slowly baked alive from the feet upward when when. John Calvin found that out. They said, he said, just, just behead him. And they didn't listen to him. And they, they liked a slow, torturous death. For 30 minutes, he screamed for mercy and prayed to Jesus as the fire worked its way up his body to burn the, the, theo the theological book strapped to his chest as a symbol of his heresy. 
And I know that many people don't believe that about John Calvin today. Now, he could, in defense of him, I, I, I cannot be the judge, and nor do I want to. But I'm trying to bring something forward to this church and to the believers looking in online. That we must be careful when your leaders tell you something. Try, examine what they teach, or vice versa. We need to be careful of the labors in the body of Christ because we need to look at and listen to what they're saying and see if it lines up with Scripture. It can happen to us today. By the way, <clears throat> religious leaders, I'm speaking about my profession, really are not that trustworthy. Gallup poll put out a, a graph of the most trustworthy ethical professions today, and guess where we're at? We're number, where are we at? Clergy's number eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, so six. Nurses, we trust more than we trust the clergy, not too far from lawyers. Now, I do want to tell you this. Many religious leaders are rock solid. I'm not going to throw a blanket over my profession. There are many that are rock solid. Here's what the scripture says for the church to be very careful of doing. It says in 1 Timothy 5, if you believe one of these leaders is leading you astray or teaching heresy, the Bible says you need to be very careful, though, about your accusations. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God in Christ Jesus and the elected angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. People did not stand up to Jesus. Or excuse me, did stand up against these accusations against him. They were bringing charges against the Son of God. And... Mm -hmm. They did not stand with him. Let's look at verse 54 now as we make our way down these verses. I, the, the second point I'd like to leave you with this morning is unfounded dirt can cause compromise. When they try to find dirt on Jesus, try to find dirt on you, try to find dirt on our leaders, um, it can cause compromise amongst the people. Notice, Jacob's going to be bringing a message on Peter, so I won't belabor this point too long, but notice in verse 54, Peter followed him at a distance right into the court of the high priest. And there he sat with the guards and warned himself at the fire. Now, I'm not going to sit and bash Peter because he's up in heaven and I want to meet him and congratulate him for the example that he was to me and to you. He was a bold man for Jesus Christ, wasn't he? I mean, he walked on water when no one else would get out of that boat in that rocky sea. He's the one to proclaim Jesus is the Son of God. He saw Jesus glorify with Moses and Elijah on the mountain. He saw him, Jesus, raise the dead. He was well acquainted with Jesus. But when you get around the wrong crowd, if you are not influencing a crowd for Jesus, you better get out of town. The Bible says separate yourself from the unbelievers because they'll start to make you compromise. So notice Peter did not come out in front and identify himself with Jesus. Perhaps you're a student in school and the kids make fun of you or you're at work and because you talk about God or they know you're a believer, there's a, you, you, you could have a tendency to back away and go along with the crowd. Or I know many compromises have been made by men and women and they go places with the ungodly men and women at work, especially around the holiday seasons and other times when they go away on business trips. You're, you could compromise if you don't stay close to Jesus. Now, what would have happened if Peter and the 12 had stayed close to Jesus? Maybe that, uh, that, uh, that fake trial uh, might have been a little bit different. Or did when Jesus said to all the, the guards, maybe it could be up to 600 Roman guards and Jewish policemen that arrested Jesus in the garden, <clears throat> Perhaps when Jesus said, leave them alone, I'm here, let them go, maybe Jesus told them, you need to get away for their own safety, possibly. But remember what each one had said when Jesus told Peter, 
after the Last Supper, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. And, and Peter said, no, I'd, I'd die for you. And all the other apostles agreed, no, we're going to die for you. What, what happened? What happened? In just a short period of time, they saw these great religious people, the people with power, the people with authority, the people with money, and they saw them influencing the crowds, and they compromised their testimonies. They compromised on the truth. You and me, if we're not aware of it, can be influenced like Peter was, and thus he compromised. We have to be very careful of who we hang out with and be very careful of what we hear and what we listen to, lest we find ourselves compromising with the truth of God. Third thing, <clears throat> the religious leader's dirty trial beginning in verse 55. They're searching for people who have dirt on Jesus. Notice, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. You know, when someone wants to do, the, do your dirty business, they don't do it by themselves. They want to include you in their dirty business. They want to include, they're not happy with sinning on their own. They want to gather as much support to make the accusations stick. So they were looking for people that would, um, that would agree with them. Notice in verse 56, they found some false witnesses. They found some dirty people. They found some dirt bags. They found some people that would, would be willing to testify against Jesus, against the Son of the living God. And ver notice in verse 56, many, many, you know, they, they probably thought they would get in good with the leaders, maybe jockey for position. I, I remember in seminary when the big wigs would come in and teach us and preach to us. And I remember the students would come up front hoping to hobnob with one of these guys and make their name known so that way when they graduated, they might get a promotion or might get a big church right away out of seminary. I remember seeing that all the time and saying, God, I, I need to trust you with whatever it is that you want me to do. Yes, it was a temptation for me also, but we need to resist that temptation and let God lead you. God said he will direct your path. But these guys were willing to go along with these, those in authority, they were, they were willing to go along and testify and lie about what Jesus had said and what he had done. Then they found some false witnesses that seemed to have their facts kind of right. Notice in verse 57 through 59. Then some of them gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say. We, we heard him say. You ever heard that? I heard him say. I heard her say. Oh, my goodness. Be very careful of that. I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Even then, their testimony did not agree. Well, we remember in the garden what Satan did with Eve, right? She, he twisted God's words. Then she ended up twisting God's words. So when you get around powerful people in powerful positions, they can twist and distort God's word, or even God's people in the church can twist and distort God's word to make it conclude what they wanted to conclude. And these individuals couldn't get it straight. Of course, they were not spiritually minded. Only spiritually minded people can interpret the things of God. The carnal people cannot. And so when he said, destroy this temple, he was talking about his temple. He had said that, but they took and twisted and distorted what he said to say he was going to destroy what took, it seemed like, mm, 50, 60, 70, maybe 70, 80 years to build the Herod's temple. And you're going to build it up in three days? So they, they, they couldn't even get that story right. So we, we, need to, we need to be aware of hearsay. We need to be aware of people on the phone or, or in our day, social media. People can quickly go along with people like on the lacrosse team. They're guilty just because the court of a public opinion said they were guilty. We need to be very careful when people come along and accuse God's people or accuse their leaders. We need to be very, very wise because the enemy wants to destroy God's church. But we need to be wise 
We need to be on our P's and Q's and look at the signs and not compromise the Scripture and follow along what the Scripture says. The Bible says, love our enemies. What about those who claim to belong to Christ? We should love them even more. Well, look how Jesus responded to them. And this is one of the ways I would encourage you to respond if you're falsely accused of something. Notice in verse 60 and 61, when the, those in authority question Jesus, notice how he responds. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus re remained silent and gave no answer. You see, they had accused him of something. We see this happening in political circles all the time. I don't care if your grandma, your grandma, your aunt and uncle, who never did a thing wrong in their lives, if they're, if they're running for political office, Trust me, they're going to find some dirt, or they'll make up the dirt. We know about that. But they accused Jesus of things that he never did. What was his response? It was silence. Silence. You, there's no way you can defend. There's no way he, he could give any type of answer. Anything that he said, we're going to find out in a second, anything that he said would be used against him. That's why we have the Fifth Amendment. I plead the Fifth. Anything you said can be held against you in the court of law. But it wouldn't have satisfied them. And he knew that. Give us a sign. He wouldn't give them a sign because he knew it wouldn't satisfy them. They had already heard and many of them had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And what did they conclude? We're going to kill him. We're going to kill him. And so... The Bible teaches that you will be falsely accused, that you and I will be falsely accused, and leaders will be falsely accused. You're going to have to use wisdom and discernment to understand, is it valid what they're accusing you of or what they're accusing your leaders of? He showed you and me courage in the face of those who played dirty. Notice Jesus, how he responds. When finally they asked him a real question, the high priest asked him again, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? In verse 62, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, Jesus showed you and me how we should conduct ourselves at work if someone accuses you of being a Christian, how you should conduct yourself in college, around the water cooler, in places in the public where someone says, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Will you have the courage to identify yourself? Yes, I am a child of God. And if all of us were honest, there are, there are times in our lives that we were like Peter where we were in a crowd and we knew we would be uncomfortable. We, would, we knew we wouldn't be accepted. We knew they would begin talking about us. If we were all honest, in some sort of subtle way, I'm not saying in a big way like Peter, we kind of backed away, either by what we said or by what we didn't say. Has that ever happened to you? I have to admit, in a small way, even sometimes I told you I, I struggled sometimes praying in public. Okay, I know as soon as I pray what those dirt bags, I'm sorry, oh, those people out there are going to be thinking about me, okay? And, and so and I, have to, I have to sometimes fight through that because I'm not a person, I've shared this with someone in my uh, Saturday group, that I, I'm not a person that likes to wear, I love Jesus. I, I'm just not one of those guys. I want to come in the back door. I want you to see me as a regular guy. I don't think it's an embarrassment because I know that neon flashing light is going to convict them of sin and they're going to attack me before I have a chance to make an inroad in their lives or the Holy Spirit to use me. I'm just not that kind of guy. Every once in a while, I'll wear something very subtle. But I want to come in the back door and then have conversation and then drop it. Hey, I'm a believer. Where would you go if you died tonight? 
I find that way has worked for me rather than the neon flashing lights and all the signs. It's not wrong. The Bible says work out your own salvation. We each find a way of how we face our enemies. But if we're honest, we've been tempted to do that. So we have to be careful to be prayed up each day because the enemy is alive. I have failed God at times because I was celebrating victory after victory after victory. Has it ever happened to you? And you forgot to be prayed up and you forgot the scripture that says the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And boom, you fall flat on your face. That's happened to all of us if we're all honest. So we have to be careful of who we hang out with. We have to be careful to make sure we're like Jesus. I am a believer in God. Is there any evidence in your life at work, at school, that they could accuse you of being a follower of Jesus Christ? I'm going I'm to get to do a wedding here at, at 1 o'clock, and then we're going to go do a funeral in Texas or be a part of it. And, and I have had people counseling in my office, and they'll say, I'm a believer in Jesus. And I'll look off the spouse and go, did you know that? No. Their own spouse didn't even know whether they were a follower of Jesus Christ. So be sure you know who you are and that you're feeding your spirit. You're hanging around the believers. You're hanging around the church, the body of Christ. Well, since his fate was sealed, he came out in the open and told the world who he was. The Bible teaches us how to respond to our accuser, but let me just go to this one verse, why I believe Jesus literally said what he said, said who he is, found in John chapter 8. Remember, he had identified himself with God and said before Abraham, I was, and then they began to interrogate him, and here's what the scripture teaches us. Are you greater than our father Abraham? I was before Abraham. He died and so did the prophets. Who in the world do you think you are? I could imagine them saying all kind of nasty things. Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him. I, I, guys, that's the preachers in the pulpit. That's the teachers and our seminaries. They're, these are the people that head up our denominations. They don't know God. Basically, he's communicating that. I want you to get through your schools. This was the people that had a corner on the market on God, who he was, how he created us, the, the plan of redemption, and they handled it wrong. They handled the responsibility poorly. But he said this, though you do not know me, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced in the thought of seeking or seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Would you like to respond that way? Every time at work? Every time at home? Every time in front of your relatives? I've had to back away in front of my relatives at times because I knew if I spoke up. I, I mentioned one guy's name once. I won't tell you who it is. A very, I'm a conservative person theologically and conservatively only because I believe there's a great... And you're going to have a chance to go vote at the polls. I believe there is a, there's two playbooks and one playbook says I have a beeline to the, white, to, the, to the White House and they champion your values and my values and the Jewish people. And they have another playbook that says I'm writing laws against how you live. And I'm redefining God's word spelled out in, in Genesis. It's not male and female anymore, I'm sorry to tell you. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist... No matter who's at the top of the ticket, I'm going, I'm going to side with the playbook that says that champions the rights of believers. And I hope you do too. Amen. It's not wrong. There's only two, there's only two ways. There's either to heaven or to hell. There's only two ways to vote. And uh, you forget about the characters and personalities. Look at what I'm telling you as a pastor. Look at the moral values. They, in the Holy Cross, they forgot about that. And Bonhoeffer wrote to the church and said, the church was silent while the political powers captured Jews 
and brought him to torture chambers. They did not stand up for what was right because we're not supposed to say anything about politics in the church. Amen. Go ahead. You can give a round clap for that. We're, who, who told us we're supposed to be silent? I'm not supposed to stand up here and tell you who you should vote for. I'm giving you a broader picture. Google out and look at the big picture. Who's championing the rights of believers? Who's attacking all of our rights? As we're talking about believers. We're not talking about other political issues. Look at it. Don't want to win at all costs. Okay, I'll end with this last point. You will know the truth from the dirt by their fruits. They were accusing Jesus of some things. Martin Luther was accusing people of some things. John Calvin was accusing people of things. People have accused pastors that are guilty, but some they've accused pastors that are not guilty. Even in this church, this has happened. And we need saints that use their wisdom and their spirits to assess properly, according to the word of God, what's happening. And people will play their hand. These individuals played their hand. You'll know them by their fruit. They condemned the innocent. Notice in verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. Well, they twisted the law. Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They twisted the law, and they, they took one side of the story. What about the people that could testify of all of his power and his glory that has been manifested before the people? Did they think of asking them? Be sure, I've always learned this when someone tells you something, almost always there's two sides of the story, almost always. Even in a marriage, I tell people this when counseling and, and doing marital counseling, I, I tell them, listen, even if you're 10% wrong, you can go tell that person, hey, I took it the wrong way, I'm sorry. Maybe that other person is 80%, 90% willing to make the marriage work and one is not. Still that person that feels they've been... Um, mistreated they still may have a hand in bringing healing you see they condemned Jesus he never opened up his mouth and then their actions began to declare who they really are who they really were what their modus operandi was notice the next verse or two and we'll be finished they all condemned him as worthy of death for saying he's a son of God. They were expecting the Messiah to come to planet Earth. Did they ever think about the evidence that proved he was the Messiah? Then here's their behavior. Then some of them began to spit on him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fist, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Their jealousy was out of control. They were jealous of Jesus because of the massive following that he had. There are times I've had to confess as a minister that I looked at other churches, or you may as a businessman or businesswoman, looked at other businesses, how well they were doing, at other families, how well they were doing, and became a little bit jealous. I'm not saying you lived or I lived in jealousy, but that temptation is really real. Why is this church doing so great and we're not? And then it's easy to talk about other pastors. Well, I, I saw this in their teaching. Then I reminded what Jesus said. If they're preaching Jesus, leave them alone. Remember that? that? That's what Jesus told us. And it spoke to me many times. And I've kind of corrected a lot of my uh, public accusations against some of these ministers. Now, that doesn't mean if they're teaching heresy, flat out heresy, that we don't need to make it known like Matthew 23 made it known that the religious establishment of that day was teaching heresy. Actually, let me, I misspoke. He said, listen to what they're saying, but don't do what they do. You see their conduct, these religious leaders' conduct, these religious people's conduct? The sign in your mind should say, that's wrong. You see all these texts, all the social media stuff, that goes against these high-profile ministers or other pastors. Look at what people are saying and what they're doing in their actions and come to conclusion in your spirit without having to know everything. Ah, 
Thank you, Lord, for the signs that tell me and identify what is dirt and what is truth. We need to be careful that, of that as a church because if we're not, the enemy could destroy us too. So we need you to pray. Would you stand at this time? If you don't know Christ as your Savior, enough has been said. Jesus went to the cross for you. He died for you. He's coming back again. Since all his promises were fulfilled, of who he was, and all the religious leaders missed it, don't miss it. He's coming back soon. Are you ready? Are you ready for him to come back? Believe that he died for you and rose again. Confess your sins, and God will adopt you into his family. Father, your word has been taught. Help us not to be so easily persuaded to follow along with the crowds. Thank you for the example that you set for us, showing courage in the face of your enemies. Would you grant us that courage? Help our roots to go deep in your word and in the truth. Most of all, help us love our brothers and sisters of Christ that prove we belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.